Evening, everyone. Um, it's uh, 522. I'm going to go ahead and open the meeting. Can you hear Mary? I can hear you. Okay. Yes. Can you see me? I can yes. see. You. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, so the first thing of the agenda is to an update on the landscaping at Christian Lane, the Cocon property. All right. Um, Sarah, do I have uh, the ability to share my screen? That I will. You do now. Okay. And uh, it looks to me like Skip Provost is here. I can see you. I see your name. You're muted. You're welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. Sure. No problem. All right. So let's see. Ah, it looks like I now have screen share uh, ability. Okay. Um, so where I think we are is um, I see that. Jeff Cocott is here on the meeting, which is great. Jeff, you can, can we hear you? See you. I can hear you. Okay, great. So there were two landscaping related issues we've been dealing with. One was a relocation of the evergreen tree. This was discussed at our last meeting. Um, there was a decision that there would be some work between the meetings to decide where the evergreen would get relocated to. Uh, uh, next amp, you know, ultimately that was sorted out and we were going to officially document that in a letter. Um, and so I'm just going to share my screen. I don't know, Jeff, if this letter was shared with you. Give me one second. Okay, so I think you're seeing a letter. I think everyone should be seeing a letter um, that starts with on January 31st, 2022. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, so we drafted this letter. Uh, Sarah looked at it, Tom looked at it. They both made the, uh, did the site visit. Seemed consistent. I think the feedback was that this was this letter addressed, properly addressed, or said what we wanted to say. Um, Jeff, I wanna give you a chance, if you haven't seen this letter, I just wanna give you a chance to look at the text and tell me whether this is consistent with what you were looking for. Yeah, I haven't seen this, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm reviewing it now, yes. I think we've kept it short and sweet. Yes. Okay. So, so Skip Provost is here. I've alerted him that we're going to be talking about this. So it seems reasonable to ask Skip if he has any concerns about this letter. And then we'll decide if we'll just basically formally sign it and send it. Skip? Skip, we're not hearing you, and you appear to be. I don't have. I don't have any concerns about the letter. I'm just curious if this will serve as. Um, a... We are really having trouble hearing you. I am you. muted. I stop my video. Okay. Can you hear me? Now? I think we can hear you now. Try again. Okay. Uh, I don't have any concerns about the letter. I would like to know if this will serve as an amendment to the initial decision um, requesting the plantings. I wouldn't think so. I'm not sure what you mean by an amendment. Yeah. To the, the uh, original planning board site approval. Oh, I see. That included the uh, requirements for planting the trees. 
Was mm. the site of that tree in the approved plan on the wrong yes. side of the property line? All the way up to the office. Oops, sorry. It was where it was shown on the original plan, it was right on the property line. And that's where it was originally planted and replaced after it was cut down. So this would be. Uh, in that case, it would be an amendment, I would think. So do we need any formal documentation of that? Well, he or, said, you know, I think this is the documentation and we should vote it. I think what we need to do is vote it as an amendment to the, to the approved conditions. Okay. All right. And I will so move. Okay. So why don't you, um, just for Mary's benefit, just clarify, make the full motion, articulate the full motion, please. I move that this letter be attached to the conditions for the approval of the site plan at 134 Christian Lane, amending, amending the uh, as-built landscape plan. And I'll second that. Do you get that motion, Mary? Almost. I'm still going. <laughs> so it'll be. It, excuse me. It, it's it's uh, okay. the approval of the the as built plan. Mm -hmm. As built landscape plan. Landscape plan. Okay. And so this letter will be your, you know, your receipt, so to speak, your documentation plus what's in the minutes. Okay. If we send right. it to him. Yeah, assuming we vote it and we will. Are there any other comments on this letter? Right. Um, any other comments from anybody else besides the board members? We will uh, take a vote. Sarah? You're muted, Sarah. Sarah said aye. Don, aye. Brent? Aye. Judy? Aye. Okay, the motion passes unanimously. Okay. So we'll, um, I'll attach Don's signature and uh, send this letter via email immediately following tonight's meeting. Okay, so that's this letter. Um, then we had some we had some broader concerns, as did the landowner. So I'm going to share a different draft letter. Um, this is not necessarily I've incorporated various changes, but we had other concerns about landscape screening at the site at 134 Christian Lane. Uh, Sarah and Tom did a site walk, reported back. And uh, so this is a revised draft of the letter. Um, I believe that Skip Provost can update us on what may already have been done. So I would recommend we give Skip the floor and then we discuss whether we need to, we want to revise this letter, send this letter, et cetera. Yes, I replied to the email this morning after reading through the letter that Brant sent. And I was out at the site and inspected the site on, um, the 27th of May um, and did notice that, that there were 10 trees on the western side of the property that were looking fairly unhealthy and some of them looked as though they had died. So at that point I contacted our landscape, uh, the gentleman that's handled the tree plantings for us, um, for the tree that was cut down 
um, knowing that we were going to be moving the tree at some point upon the decision from the board, uh, we ordered the trees and he has them in stock. Um, and once we have come up with a date with Jeff to go out and plant the evergreen tree, or move the tree, we will replace those um, unhealthy trees that are on the west side of the array. Um, we had also uh, replaced a couple of um, the arborvitaes um, when the tree out at the edge of the street was replaced. Um, so we are working on making sure that we are addressing the trees on um, when they do the plantings. I'll also have his, his uh, horticulturalist uh, accompany, the, accompany them and do any necessary pruning and check on the health of the rest of the, uh, the shrubs that are out there. Weed whacking has also been done uh, a couple of times to clean up around all the shrubs and is scheduled to be done again this week. Okay. So how does that sound to people? And so really two questions. How does that sound, comments, and is sending this letter or a version of this letter necessary at this point? I think it's a good documentation of the issues. If Is there a date on it? Um, I have attached, at the, we can, right now I put the date of today on the, on the yeah. letter. Well, it sounds as though nothing has quite yet been addressed. Um, it's in the process, but this is a, documentation of the procedure. Um, I don't see any harm in sending it. And it will, he will be able to say that he said, fix things very quickly, I would think. I have a question that's a bit tangential to this, but is there anything in the ground underneath the um, panels? when Tom and I did the walk in early April, um, it almost looked like bare ground. It had been recently reseeded um, with a pollinator mix because that site is part of the UMass Amherst pollinator program. So that uh, I think in the fall, they re the, the group that oversees the pollinator projects uh, determined that there wasn't enough of the pollinator plants growing. Um, so they tilled the soil and seeded it and left it for the winter so that it would regrow in the springtime. Um, That's good to know. We have some our pretty severe wind issues here. Yeah. And it needs the, head, the ground. The engineering needs to team was out. Old. <clears throat> over um, the civil engineering head, department head was out last week, I believe. And she reported to me that it was in need of being cut. So I'm fairly certain that it's all fully revegetated um, and we'll cut it in accordance with the pollinator program. Thank you. No problem. Any other comments? So I think what I'm hearing is that, like the first letter, I'll attach Don's signature and send this along to Mr. Provost as you know, for the record. And a copy to Mary. Yes, of course. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, I think um, the actions we've done don't really call for a motion. So I think we're okay with leaving it as is. Thanks, Skip, for coming. Thank you very much, Skip. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome, and uh, reach out to me when anytime you have any concerns of any of the projects that we have in Waitley, um, reach out directly. Uh, we usually try to rectify situations as quickly as possible. Very good to know, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, debriefing. The next is uh, debriefing on the zoning comments. Uh, the 
account at ATM. So I presume that is mostly, uh, <laughs> well, Brent did all the talking, so. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I was suggesting that we just compare notes. There were the three of us, me, Judy, and well, and Tom was there, but did Tom send any comments to you, Judy? Yes, he did. I will read them. Um, he says, what I heard at the town meeting seemed to be versions of a larger theme we have been hearing for some time, neighborhood slash abutters slash taxpayers concerns about a given proposal that will affect real or perceived their quality of life, their property value, and the character of their neighborhood. We have heard these concerns regarding marijuana, solar, and state road rezoning trucking projects. These concerns were amplified in the recent town meeting. While this observation does not lend itself to a specific bylaw proposal, I'm concerned that the planning board becomes perceived as pro this or pro that, where the citizen neighbor can't get a fair shake. Emphasis on perceived. While it is only one data point, 40 to nine vote to table state road rezoning and lively marijuana discussion may be the indications may be the indications. Best, Tom. Yeah. Hmm. Well, my really? thing on the mayor's wanted discussions is that most people were just really concerned about uh, something they didn't understand. And I think that we ended the, the town meeting with not nearly as much concern uh, for the marijuana occupational things that can be done as, as um, I don't really think that's as much of a problem at, any, at this point. Actually, I, I would totally disagree with that. My reading was that um, everyone was very concerned about anything to do with marijuana in a homeowner's occupation, home occupation, that they didn't trust the enforcement if it was a delivery system, they felt that even though in theory, a delivery system should not have any marijuana on the property, they didn't trust that to be well enforced. And I think given our problems with enforcement, that might not be a bad assumption. And I got the sense that they just didn't think that that kind of an occupation had any business being being part of homeowner's occupation, which is why I drafted the bylaw amendment I did. Also, as part of the discussion, um, Fred Barron on the select board at one point said, well, that doesn't, home occupation doesn't affect anything that's being voted on here. Planning board can go back and address that and bring a solution to us at a special town meeting. And I took that as a a strong nudge to do same. So, but I think that's that's slightly different than the. Well, I don't know that it's different than the point Tom was making, but I think I think the concerns were slightly. No, I'll I'll walk that back. Never mind. My sense is that the general concern isn't with any specific bylaw, but with, a, to use Tom's word, a perception that maybe the board is is being too lenient with the with the applicants. And I'm I'm afraid we've given them a perception that we're negotiating with the applicants, which I. Um, I'm not sure it's true, but I think there's that perception. If you ask, well, is this okay with you? We shouldn't be doing that. We, we, should, be, we should be establishing a position and letting them tell us when they're not okay with something. But 
Well, I just perceive that as being politeness. I mean, the, well, there is, but I, again, it is politeness. But I think the issue is perception. Well, you know, I, it, I also think that the typical participant doesn't, typical a butter, doesn't feel that he really, he or she really understands the rules. Uh, I think they feel a little bit intimidated by the engineers and the lawyers that the applicants have. And I noticed with the green jeans, and, and I think with one other application, as soon as they could comment on chat, the abutters were much more vocal than when they were speaking in person. It gave them a degree of comfort they didn't have otherwise, which is in one way nice, but another way disturbing that they didn't feel comfortable mm -hmm. commenting. Well, I imagine that, you know, we all heard some, some different things. I definitely heard a concern about enforcement. And so I resonate with the comments about that that Tom made. I think Rich Korpuski, who kind of led the led the led the charge, you might say, that got the rezoning motion tabled. Uh, and he's expressed this in at our meetings before, just this concern about commercial activities in town. I think he's got my sense of, of Mr. Korpuski is he's got a very balanced, a fair and balanced view that he understands what it means to be residing within the commercial district, but doesn't necessarily feel like um, it, that the planning board, that there should be a free for all allowed um, with businesses you know, allowed in that district and the burdens that they may create in regards to traffic and, and elsewhere. So I'm not quite sure what to do about that. I think there is, you know, we've, I think one of the things that might have contributed to a perception about planning board leniency is you know, the oft, you know, the, the common refrain that the planning board cannot deny these applications, we can only attach conditions to them. And I'm pretty sure that residents have come to these meetings advocating to the planning board, to us, that essentially we deny something. And, and so what we've instead done is created you know, we have in some sense negotiated by trying to place reasonable conditions on these site plan approvals that we believe ref reflect our best effort to protect residents, but aren't basically gratuitous ways of denying these applications without actually denying them. You could place such burdensome conditions on a site plan approval that it would make it all but impossible to really do. And really all that would do is invite lawsuits, which would not be good for the town and, and for the board. So anyway, I don't know quite what to do about the enforcement. The home occupation thing is an interesting one. I'm not quite sure I heard what Judy heard. Um, I think there is confusion around what what are home occupations and what can people do as home occupations? There is really no enforcement, you know? I think I heard Fred Orlowski speak up to that very point, you know? I think his words were to the effect of where's, you know, who's doing the enforcement? Who's checking in on these things? And the reality is that um, as we all know, there is no proactive inspections, enforcement, or anything like that. Um, so the bylaws 
are really only enforced when somebody reports a concern. Um, well, that's the way it's been in town for as long as I've been here. Yeah. I don't know that there have been any problems. Well, Rich brings his own problems on himself. He well, no, I'm, I'm stick to the home program. occupation. Let's let's yeah. the t the two issues I think are are different. The the enforcement issue is much cleaner on a on a commercial and industrial project project that has to go through a special permit and site plan review. Yeah. Um, there's a document. There's a beginning point. There's a there's an, usually an occupancy permit. Where we get into trouble or where things are difficult is if no building permit is pulled because that's usually the trigger for the, for the mm -hmm. zoning officer. But you know, when complaints are made, somebody sends something, some the building inspector out. I wonder if this is a trust issue that, I mean, trust in government and government institutions is, is rampant. And is there just a lack of trust that the town is adequately overseeing these bylaws and the marijuana facilities and so forth? And I don't know quite how more zoning bylaw changes can address trust if trust is really the issue. Well, a lot of it, I think, has to do with the complexity of the issue, both the projects and the number of bylaws that people have been asked to look at lately. I know they've bothered us and we spend a lot of time studying them. Um, one thing that might be productive is to ask Rich to write down his thoughts on what could specifically could be improved. And another is to do some sort of survey on what other towns do for have for bylaw regulations on either site plan review regulations, but I think more specifically bylaw regulations mm -hmm. on commercial and and not sure we should limit things to commercial because you know, I can't think of a reason you would want to look just at commercial without looking at it, commercial and indu industrial and industrial. Yeah. Um, we might just start by asking Peggy Sloan if, if she's ever done that kind of thing, a comparison. I know I have looked at a couple of other towns site plan review and ours is, ours is way more extensive. The number of things we can look at and question than say Deerfield's. Deerfield's mm -hmm. planning board has very little power. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's a matter of just educating people on some of those things. Excuse me, but-, but I, I'm sorry, sir. I just was just going to ask if somebody could give me Rich's last name for the minutes. Korpiaski. Korpiaski, okay. With a K. Um, I know I, within the little over a year ago, my husband and I attended a Deerfield Planning Board meeting. And interestingly, their uh, building inspector was there. So I know for me, myself, I do feel out of touch with our enforcement, mm -hmm. but we also, our building inspector enforcement is through the COG. It's not town. They have their own. Right. It's <laughs> an extra level of difficulty. There are good things and bad things about that too. I know in Weston, mm -hmm. the building inspector drives the planning board crazy because he's always making determinations that they don't agree with. and. Hmm. But that's yeah, Mike. Yes, uh, Don. In the uh, respect to enforcement, I'm going to go back a few years with the with a farm brewery that became much more than what it was supposed to be, and that's 
the whole thing. What is the enforcement when that became more than what it was under the farm system and became more of a commercial venture to where the enforcement or the enforcement officer was like in that case? That's an example of the building inspector not being where you thought he ought to be. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the thing from an abutter point of view or a townsfolk anywhere is that once things get rolling, where is the enforcement we can rely on to make sure things are being done to the order of conditions that were set and in a timely manner and not dragging on for years when it should be, you know, within six months or, or one year and it's two and three down the road. Mm -hmm. What are the avenues of recourse that can be used to put it into compliance or to shut it down, so to speak? Well, that's interesting because that's a different perspective. That's, that's not that the bylaw or the initial review process is a problem. It's that the ongoing implementation is. And um, maybe that's something we, we should just specifically be addressing in site plan review. Why don't you put that down on paper and send us it? <laughs> uh, I don't want to kill that many trees. Ah, oh, come on. You can it write can, it in an email and send yeah, it. It could just be an email. Oh, OK. I'll have my, uh, my proofreader take care of it for me. So no, that's just a thought from, from someone who's no, been outside of it for a while, but also has been involved many years ago for a profession into uh, working for either clients or towns when things have happened that needed to be addressed at a, at a higher level. Yeah. I think that's the same perception that that leads to that same perception for that property that we accommodated the change of zoning for hmm. on five and 10. Yeah. One other thing that occurs to me that a lot of these things that people are unhappy with have to do with noise and noise at early hours and late hours. And that should be addressed by a general bylaw, not, not a zoning bylaw. I mean, you, you can condition operations if in fact it goes through site plan review, but there are circumstances when something doesn't necessarily go through site plan review. And it also affects things like construction, you know, if somebody starts well, around here, they started at six o'clock in the morning the other day with heavy equipment drilling a well, and I, I wasn't too pleased about that. Happy to have the well drilled, but yeah. um, so maybe that's something we should be thinking about. All right, or talking to somebody about. I don't know who. That's a process issue. I don't know how general bylaws necessarily get initiated. I know, Judy, in some respects, some cities and towns that we had complete zoning for back in my younger days, they did have noise ordinances that were separate from specific planning boards and as a yep. subsection of, the, of town and city zonings of yep. how many decibels between what hours and times yep. and things yeah. of that nature. Yeah, I think it's like a general operating, it's a general bylaw, like a dog leash requirements and things like that. So I think this is a really, I think this issue of noise is a really interesting one. And, and I also wanna to get to odor, but I think this, this case in point with green genes is gonna be an interesting one. Cause I was also looking at the minutes of the January 25th meeting where we were having quite a discussion about green genes and the fans and the potential for fan noise. Um, we, we won't yet, I mean, until the Green Jeans facility is really built and operating, we won't really know whether the fan noise is really going to be a problem. 
we know, all we know is that there will be, fans will be running where before there were no fans running. And so we're, we get into the zone of what do a butters consider to be like audible or a reasonable level of noise. Um, Curse we, that, that, that possibly we could uh, go down and take a look at what's going on in, on River Road because there's fans in those greenhouses. And I will tell you, River Road was just in my mind on more with respect to odor, but I think the, the, the fan noise is another good one. I right. know we have, I think, a big latent trust issue in this community when it comes to marijuana odor. And we have approved a number of these facilities without really, you know, we've put in these requirements, but we have no actual experience with odor. And it seems like if my memory is correct, Seven River Road should be cultivating this season is, and, and so it might be worth following up, first of all, checking in with them to see, is that really happening? And checking in with the, a butter who was concerned about odor to find out, do they have any ongoing concerns? And also maybe broaden that to fan noise. And I would be very happy, I would be happy, it's not that far from where I live to run down there and see what I can uh, learn as just a guess. Okay. I'll remind you that we asked the select board or the whichever committee it is that's deciding to do with the community impact funds that we would like them, some of them dedicated to hiring professional engineer to monitor odor. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be the place to go. I would be surprised if the crop is far enough along yet to have any odor problem, but maybe. Yeah, I don't know enough about. Last I knew, none of the, none of the projects were active, at least as of town meeting. That's what Brian said. No, I've I think certainly he said seen there was construction. No, no. I've certainly seen construction at the yeah. Seven River Road site. I think he said there was no impact he's collected yet. But. Right. But I recall them, a DMCTC, saying that they intended to start cultivating at least indoors in the spring. So, and I seem to also recall that the grow cycles were on the order of six to eight weeks. I don't know where I'm getting that from, but shows you how little I know about marijuana cultivation. Sarah is grinning. <laughs> No, I don't know either, but I just know that I have heard, I know hemp has been, grow, there's a lot of, much more experience with hemp and odors in the last couple of years. There is no regulation of odors from hemp. So many people have been like, wow, this stuff stinks, depending on your point of view where you are. There is definitely an odor from hemp that is not controllable. So I think many people are taking that experience from the last couple of years and worried about that in terms of the marijuana effects. Well, two years ago, maybe it was three at this point, um, the greenhouse at, at Christian Lane and, and Rue 5 did grow hemp and um, they got no complaints there. It's more the open field hemp. I don't know. Well, it was it was open field. field. One. It, was. it was open field. Yeah. It was five acres of open field, Sarah. Yeah. Oh, must not be how the wind blew. Yeah. Because <laughs> I know my husband will comment on it. Um, Melnick, not Melnick's aren't growing any this year, but Melnick from the last couple of years, along 91, it was certain times, it was very noticeable. Huh. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that I, you know, run to the select board to say, go ahead and hire an engineer. Let's start monitoring odor all over the place. I think I'd like to start, at least with Seven River Road, to find, get an update on where, where they are with their project. If they're growing, 
And if the, uh, and depending on that, the out, that status, find out from the abutter if they have any ongoing concerns. Well, I'd just like to remind them that we feel we'd like the authority to do that and have somebody investigate who a good professional might be because, and I also thought that we could combine with other towns because there's enough, you know, that collectively we could maybe put somebody on retainer. But at the rate things are going, <laughs> we may never have a project. <laughs> well, Brent, why don't you and I uh, try to make a visit to that sometime this week? I think that's a great idea. Um, I'll, I'll let's plan sometime next week, and I will. I will. I think I still have the contact email address um, for them, so I'll reach out to them by email and see what we could set up for a visit. Great. And I think a very good measure of a way to feel we're more involved in the community is reaching out to the abutters to get their feedback specifically, also. I yeah. think that will go a long way towards our perception. Yeah. Excuse and these me. are things that we could also document, you know, if we do the, take these actions, if there is a trust issue, um, if we can document the actions that we've taken and the outcomes, um, that, could, that could help. All right, so maybe we should, I don't know that there's anything more, we can probably talk all night long. <laughs> about town meeting. I, I just found it funny how that we spent, I think it was 45 minutes at town meeting approving 23, I think it was, or 22 warrant articles in rapid succession with almost no questions where large amounts of money were being spent. And then we spent the next hour and 15 minutes <laughs> on just the three planning board articles. I think yeah, it would and be, yeah. half of that time was about something that wasn't involved with any of those articles, yeah. which is the homeowner occupation. So I really do think it doesn't need to be tonight, but I do think we should spend some time thinking about changing that because I, I think the town's perception of what a home occupation is, is, is much more restrictive than the bylaw. So I'll come back to a point you made earlier, Judy. I really do like the idea of, I feel like we're navigating this area in a little bit of a, in a, in a fog. When I went to vote at our recent election, I happened to talk to Donna Wiley, who apparently was there, and she recognized me from town meeting and said something like, yeah, you know, everything was going fine until you made this offhand comment about home occupations. And I asked her a little bit more and she seemed to say, oh, it just everyone got confused about what home occupations are and what's allowed. And, and it, I didn't get the sense from her that people were, oh, now they're afraid of marijuana as a home occupation. So I just like to gather more information. That's well, sure, that's but I, I can do. remember all this bit about enforcement, which was clearly related to, to fear. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was with delivery, which in theory shouldn't be a matter where, where, um, it mattered, but they 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 didn't trust the enforcement mechanism, and they didn't trust the applicant. Like maybe that's that's part of it. Huh. Um, but I think it comes, you know, I think it's broader than just marijuana. I don't think I don't think they like a distillery or. Hmm. A firearms dealer. Um, a make your own yeah. cigarette dealer. Yeah. I mean, I think there are a whole range of adult toys. I mean, you know, there are a lot of things that are restricted that yeah. you wouldn't want your kids getting too close to. And I, yeah. I think it's just that kind of thing. It's not just marijuana. Yeah. And I think it just never occurred to anybody that that would be part of 
mm. a home occupation until we started talking about marijuana. Yeah. But there's no reason somebody couldn't be a um, specialty gun dealer, I don't think. It would be a good home occupation. Yeah. And, and if we and start do lots going of sales that, without we, yeah, conscience. I mean, I'm, I'm with, I guess what I say is once you start going there, suddenly I can imagine the Waitley Planning Board becoming nationalized. <laughs> And ending up on certain networks for banning. No, uh, no, no. I think I think you're just. Uh, I I would say that you can't do products or services that are restricted to license and restricted to adult use only, or something like that. I mean, it's fairly. You would need a more precise wording than that. So maybe we should close on the town meeting because I know. And, and we should decide with our remaining time. Do we want to talk about Judy's proposed amendment? Do we want to just get some minutes out of the way? Why don't let's put leave the amendment till the next meeting, and I'll try and reach out to Peggy Sloan or somebody and see if I can get a better definition. She's the one who got me thinking about this because she said that's just not the type of business marijuana. She talked about marijuana. It's just not the type of business that this provision was intended for. And it was very clear to her. And I think that must be the way all the other towns interpret it. So mm -hmm. I will, I'll see if there are other towns that have some specific things okay. or if she can help with wording. Okay. And, and I just again say that I have this general sense that right now, when I look at the home occupation section of the bylaw, it seems fine to me, and I, I have all of these similar enforcement questions, like there's all kinds of things that we can start to ban, but it starts to mean that we're basically asking people to snitch on other people about what's going on within their homes. And that, I'm just worried about the slippery slope effect. I mean, yes, maybe I, I don't like I don't like firearms and somebody else doesn't like sex toys and somebody else doesn't like pornography and what kind of community, you know, right now we seem to be at a time where everybody wants to ban everything and I understand the instinct. But if we don't have meaningful enforcement and we don't want a regime where home occupations now need to register with the town and be subjected to annual inspections, which I'm not sure we want to go there, um, ex, you know, throwing in more clauses that just basically s tell people who they can snitch on about things. I don't know. I, I, I'm not saying there no. are a lot of and there I'm, are a lot of towns that require any business in town to register with town hall. I, I agree, but we don't. We don't know, require, but, but maybe that's maybe that's your. So maybe that's a maybe that's. I mean, a that's question. a that's a way to get enforcement without without snooping. So that I think really would push the button on the issue. Like if we're saying if we believe that say a majority of Waitley residents are concerned about home occupations, then we'd have to ask, well, now if we place this burden on home occupations, and what's that gonna require? And are we gonna hear from very, what, what might we hear from people who do run home occupations about uh, a new requirement? Which I, I guess would I wouldn't on. limit it. No, I think there's a valid reason to do that entirely independent of any issue with home occupations. I think that's very important. I have at least five times in various committees and civic things tried to find lists of businesses in Waitley and they don't exist. Yeah. Um, it's also probably helpful to the assessors to have a feeling for what businesses are and how they change and if, mm -hmm. if a property turns over. Mm -hmm because uh, they don't have records of it. I mean, there are a lot of reasons you would do this. 
Um, actually, I doubt, the, I doubt that most, you know, I don't think the city of Lexington imposes this requirement because they're worried about their home occupation bylaw. Judy, actually, the 250th committee did get all of the, the businesses in Whateley because we went out and solicited them for. Donations. Yeah, and I provided the list that I compiled myself as part of it. Yeah. I know. And I don't think it's complete. Well, it's pretty complete, though. Well, well I mean, I had the list of home occupations, right? Because there wasn't one. All right. Well, I think um, I smell a dead horse. So why don't we go on to uh, approval of minutes? I was out all day and I checked mail when I got in at 5.30 and uh, I see that we've got at least a couple emails and I haven't had a chance to look at those. Um, is, is that what we've got, just two right now? Yeah. Okay. Judy, have you um, gone through and done edits on those? Yeah, Brandon and I both have, and his, um, I would say that all of the edits follow, fall in the cleanup category. There aren't any real substantive meaning changes, I don't think. Would you agree, Brant? I there, would agree. Like, there, the, there the address significant change was the address of uh, Green Jeans in the um, January 4th minutes. Yeah. Um, I, I think Brant's additions to the Housing Committee commentary added some substance that I'm not sure happened at the meeting, but it's very, it's very educational. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's good stuff. Um, no, I think it's, uh, I, I would say that min minutes were on balance excellent. And I don't think either of us found anything substantive. So I think I would move to, so right now we're just, well, I think given the fact that Judy and I have both gone over these minutes, depending on how Sarah and Don feel, you're willing to trust, trust us on these. I've read them. Okay. Oh, you have great. So we have three sets of eyes on this. So maybe we can just vote to. He hasn't said whether she agrees with our comments. Oh yeah. Um, yes, it's cleaning up. There are some, Brent did explain some things that weren't just a more general thing that chapter 40 be in the percentage of our housing. I mean, those weren't things that were specifically listed at the meeting, but those are good general information of how this impacts generally. Um, and a lot of people, I think the general public does not understand 40B. But yeah. Yeah. I think I, yeah, I remember just, um, yeah, cutting and pasting a couple of, yeah. It's, so I'm torn. I, I don't think it's harmful to leave it in. I think- No, it's, there's no problem leaving it in. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I think you made us look much more erudite. Very <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, then I'm all for that. If um, if you've got three of us who think we're okay, then we have a quorum anyway, and Don can just not vote. Okay. All right. So I'm going to move that we approve the minutes of January 4, 2022. Second. Is that as as amended? As amended. Okay, uh, we have a motion and a second. Any further comments? Okay, we'll take a vote. 
Uh, Don, abstain. Sarah? Uh, I approve. Judy? Aye. Brent? Aye. Motion passes. Okay. So we can, so Sarah, you also had a look at the January 25th minutes yep. as amended. Because it would be good to get us as caught up as we can. Yes, I went through those also. I'll just look at again what I. Come on. That was about the accessory apartments, Mr. Gleason. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just taking another look at it, and it seemed like there was no. I mean, the most significant change that I made was the bit about what we did at that meeting regarding the change to the large scale solar bylaw was very incomplete and it wasn't clear what we actually did at the meeting. So I added a fair amount of text to just clarify that we had a, that we had a request for a zoning bylaw change, said what it, what it involved and that we agreed to schedule a public hearing. So everything else I think is straightforward. And Mary said she found the information she was looking for. I realized I just had to go to the agenda. It's all okay. posted on the website. All right. okay. okay, do we have a motion? I move we accept the minutes as amended. Minutes of January 25th as amended. <laughs> I'll second that. that. Okay. Then. Any further comments? If not, we'll take a vote. Don will abstain. Sarah? Aye. Judy? Aye. Brad? Aye. Okay, the motion passes. Okay. All right. And I think we beat most of the additional items to death as well. Yeah. Okay. So I will. So just to review some actions, I'm going to complete the two letters to Nexam. So Don, I'll paste in your signature from a previous letter, and make it official. And I will um, turn it into a PDF document, put it in OneDrive, send it to um, Nexam CC Mary, and I should CC the town clerk, correct? Is it should be added to the record? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so I'll do that for both of the letters. And then I'll reach out to, um, I'm blanking, I apologize, but I'm blanking on the name of the person at Seven River Road, but I'll reach out to him about um, having a stop by to just find out a little bit more about how things are going and um, what's going on in terms of odor and noise and so forth. And maybe try to set up a, a, a time for you and me, Don, to visit next week. And then maybe while we're there, we can knock on the next door neighbor's door and see if anyone's home. Okay. All right, sounds great. Is anyone gonna ask Rich Korpieski for- Yeah, how do we reach, yeah, does anyone have his contact information? Well, I've got his email. Um, if if you ever want anybody's address, you go to the assessor's map yeah. and look where they send the tax bills. Right, right. So it sounds like an email. So like Judy, would you like to either you could just simply email Rich directly, or you could send me text and I could email him from the planning board account. Your Why don't you? Oh, he'd be very impressed to get it from the planning board account, I think. <laughs> okay. Um, you want what, are we, what are we addressing over this? 
So this was a, we were going to send a communication to Rich Korpiewski. Korpiewski. Uh, Korpiewski. Um, um, thanking him for the comments that he made at annual town meeting that the planning board seeks his input and uh, would like to better understand his concerns about enforcement of zoning bylaws or other related concerns. No, I would place it as changes he thinks would be appropriate okay. or kinds of changes he's looking for. Just, I wouldn't go to enforcement. I just leave okay. it more general and let him, let him define it. Okay, happy to do that. But I will need you, Judy, to send me his email address. Yep. Okay. And Michael's going to email us a nudge to keep a condition on timing of implementation of site plan conditions, aren't you? Okay, Judy, I will. And I just want to thank you folks for listening. And I'll be signing off now. Okay. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mike. You're welcome. Hey, Gretchen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So can I make a motion to adjourn? That's always in order. <laughs> so moved. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. The meeting is adjourned.